we see this as an empty, endless country, waiting to be exploited. Its regular horrific droughts are seen as challenges to overcome. Our blindness to the realities of this arid inland of Australia threatens its very physical survival, more so than a hundred droughts or bushfires. No matter how blameless and safe it feels in the shelter of the coastal cities, the consequences of our attitudes have compounded into this barren wasteland. And it's still going on. That's the tragedy. I've been working in the bush for about 11 years and I've come to realise it's not fair to put all of the blame on pastoralists for the bare and barren land that I can find out here. Most of inland Australia is crown land, our land. Pastoralists are just the temporary caretakers of that land. They lease it from the government and they use it and they earn their living that way. But it's the government who is the ultimate landlord. It's the government that has the responsibility for the well-being of this country. And clearly, they've failed. But we must take some of the blame. What pressures have we put on the government to do a good job? What concern have we shown that governments maintain and, and, and care for this land? We've got two options. Either we act now and save what we've got left, or we go on the way we have been in the past and let the same mistakes be made over and over again. And each time it happens, an area of productive land is turned into a dust bowl. This is not the Middle East, nor Ethiopia, nor the Sahara. This is all our own. It's our sheep country. What a hell of a mess this place is in. You can see the damage that's being done by a wind on a day like today. Now, all of this country used to be covered with salt, salt bush. Beautiful, thick stands of salt bush. And they don't now. There's a fence right through the middle. And it isn't drought. Drought doesn't stop at a fence line. There's the same number of kangaroos on this side as there is on this side, and rabbits too. The difference down this fence line is man-made. Man did this. Man kept too many sheep here for too long contained by a fence. Devastation like this is common across huge areas of our inland. These shameful scars can't even be hidden from a thousand kilometers out in space. This satellite picture shows us that fence line. The dark tones are where the salt bush still remains. The light tones are where the salt bush has been grazed out and the soil is left bare. This is an area in South Australia, but the same pattern of overgrazing can be found right throughout the inland of Australia. Man's imprint on the land is brutally forceful. The decisions this man makes will affect a large chunk of Australia. 
Ian McDonnell is a third generation grazier. My family took up land in this area, northeast of South Australia, in 1911. It's about 370 square miles. And I've now been managing it for six years. He's a pastoralist with real concern. He knows his daily decisions will have a lasting impact on the land he leases. What we have to try to balance off is uh, economic gain as against the damage we do. Certainly there is a dilemma. Uh, one can only has to look around to see what has been done in the past. Uh, there's been a lot of unfortunate things happen. Most of it's happened through ignorance and some of it's happened because people have been financially pressed one way or another. Perhaps uh, the bank hasn't been terribly sympathetic when it's the middle of a roaring drought and people have been forced to hold on to stock or try to carry more stock than they ought to. This is a, this is a, a constant problem for us, economics. We are in a, in a situation where this is a long-term country and that you, you can have droughts for, for several years and uh, short-term economics don't fit into that picture, really. To maintain an income, he needs to keep sheep here on his property. But he also knows those sheep can eat bare this land and in one season cause damage that will last for decades. Uh, there's been a great amount of damage done to soils through overgrazing, uh, removing vegetation from the country and causing erosion. The white man has left a pretty large impact and this has been brought about by perhaps a lack of sympathy and a lack of understanding of the workings and the uh, requirements of the arid zone, its limitations. As a society, we let individuals like Ian McDonald wrestle with decisions about our land, but refuse him the flexibility that's required. This is not Europe. It doesn't rain every year. But our system of leases, annual finances and regulations that's been adopted from the British doesn't allow for three out of five years to generate little or no income. The Australian ecosystem knows nothing of financial years. For a while, you can force this land to surrender an income each year, but only by grazing out these native bushes that took a century to grow just a metre tall. This land has sustained human occupation for tens of thousands of years. It must have looked like this to the first European explorers and settlers. Except for this dust. Only since we have mismanaged this country does a windy day always mean dust storms, whipped up as a testimony to our occupation an occupation whose consequences can leave this land with little protection for the elements. <laughs> there's not much rain in that, and it's not going to do very much good either. If we care so little for this country that we can let it get so overgrazed and so bare, it's going to take a hammering from every raindrop, every raindrop, is going to wash what remaining nutrients we've got away. When ground is bare, rain can lose its benevolence and become a destructive force. So I expect you won't have a problem with Yes, right. Okay. okay. Say bye bye, bye. Daddy. Bye, bye Sarah. Bye bye. That's a girl. Daddy's gone on the motorbike. Oh, yes. You won't be home till late tonight, I don't Ian and Caroline extend their very caring attitude to their land. They question 
They speak up. They invest time, money and their enormous energies into trying to preserve the future of their chunk of Australia. But they do so against enormous odds. Because, as a society, we've denied them the flexibility the land cries out for. I find, I suppose now, particularly because there's the drought on too, I feel that, that we're just fighting an uphill battle. You just can't grow back in a year what's happened over 100 years. I feel that Ian sort of, well, he would very much like to see this property in a lot better condition than when he took it over, particularly areas that have been badly eaten out. He really would like to get back what the country originally was so that the whole property is in much better condition. The McDonald's have been confined and the land can't take that type of imposition without being damaged and ultimately blowing away. One way is to live in sympathy with Arid Australia. The earliest tribal inhabitants knew it. They moved with the seasons, followed the game. When drought struck one region, the ruse moved to another where food and water remained. They left the drought area to regenerate without the constant pressure of grazing. In the days of grand cattle kings, the nomadic pastoralists would move their cattle with the seasons, unrestricted by fences or boundaries. Sidney Kidman had one solution that he used with skill. As drought struck, Kidman would respond by moving his cattle to a better area, no matter how distant. Kidman cattle could walk from one end of Australia to the other. He could do it because he amassed a giant string of properties across the land. That gave him his flexibility. Today, such freedom of movement is not possible. But what is needed is a freedom from restrictions and regulations that cause damage to the land. We've confined more than just our animals behind the rigid barriers and administrative decisions. At 81, Wally Snelson struggles with the consequences of a decision made before his birth. Wally Snelson inherited his property from his father, who was a soldier settler after the First World War. The government found the land to settle the soldiers by resuming the leases of the original pastoral properties and dividing them up. They created many where there were few. Politically, it was a very popular move. But the city-based politicians and bureaucrats didn't have to live with the consequences of that decision, what it did to the land and to the people. I think that by cutting up the, the areas as small as they did, uh, and uh, that came about to a large extent by political influence, I think it was definitely detrimental to Western. This is a satellite picture of the type of country where Wally lives. Originally, this would have been one or two large properties. When you look at these very small boxes, these tiny little properties, it's most striking that most of them are very badly eroded. 
all of this was a consequence of that division, that dividing up of the large properties that survived quite well into the small ones. It wasn't a living area. We couldn't buy any more country, or if if we did, we wouldn't have been able to exceed more than about 3,000 sheep. And of course, you couldn't get a parcel of land that would just bring it to that amount. I had an opportunity to buy one parcel, which would have been 400 sheep more than the um, maximum set by the government and I was not allowed to buy it. For Wally, just like his father, it meant a life of toil. In the first three years of sun up to sundown work, this property netted him 15 pounds. It meant a deprivation that he'll only hint at even now. I had to live very carefully. What is hardship? They were just their living to those restrictions. And their living would have been much below uh, the standards, uh, the general standards, say, in the cities, or they were denied uh, quite a lot of things that accepted uh, as uh, necessities away from here, they were considered luxuries here. So they, they had to cut their cloth according to the measure and live according to that. Decisions on how this land would be administered did more than just restrict the incomes of thousands like Wally Snelson. It resulted in fundamental and permanent changes to this land. The rolling grasslands, the very reason for this country's settlement had been replaced by a thick, inedible scrub. And it's happened within living memory. Uh, I had an old man who camped with me for seven years. He was, uh, he was born in 1841 and he came out through this country in 1864. He said it was uh, open country, some big pines and big gums, but no yarn and thick scrub on that. It was a uh, beautiful open country. At that time, well a few years later when stock were put on, it was, this country was carrying about a sheep to three acres. And that was grassy country then? Yes, it was grass country. Well, the country has changed, Wally. It has changed. This major ecological shift slipped under our guard because of a failure to understand the direct cause of the change. Fire had been the force that created and maintained the grasslands, but it's a force we have been loath to accept or understand. With the loss of fire, a change came about in the vegetation. We had disturbed a balance. The grasslands had few shrubs and it was, they were maintained like that through fire. Fire had gone, the shrubs increased, they competed with the grass for water and nutrients until they replaced the grass. And now, it's a shrubland with very little grass and it will remain that way until we see the return of fire. In Australia, the problem of scrub taking over the grasslands is not just restricted to a few properties. It covers huge areas, stretching from central Queensland to Victoria. Much of the ecology of our land is dependent on fire. That fact is at odds with our misplaced urge to leave the bush unburnt. We organise regular appeals for the victims of uncontrolled bushfires, but we won't concede that controlled burning is in sympathy with the land. 
fences, all drop in well. Over. We've got a bit of a spot over here at about uh, cage seven. Take that over the fence. So that's that cage. Not the wrong one, but it's happening today. Might get a spot over up there too. Is that crowning? Uh, is John down there or not? Simply better to go down there. John's up there. Oh, that's a new attitude to fire and its role in the modern Australian context might lessen the number of bushfires and reduce the tragic loss of human life. Land, as an issue, is not prominent in our modern society. It's easy to be deflected by the immediate concerns of budgets, economics, and the daily fluctuations of stock markets. But ultimately, the well-being of this nation is locked into the health of its land. Yet we seem unconcerned about our long-term future, what sort of land our children will inherit, and what sort of economy they'll have to struggle with as a result. Each year I come out here to measure the type and numbers of plants that survive and the amount of soil that's left. Each year the news is worse, but I hear very little public debate. The measurements I make with this thing, the plants and the soils, along with Landsat, give me a very clear understanding of what's happening here. Although you don't have to be very sophisticated. A blind man on a galloping horse can see what's happening at this place. But what annoys me so much is all of this information, both the modern and the old, never seems to be used. Various state departments of lands and other departments, they don't even seem to recognise the threat to this land, our land leave alone act as responsible landlords. Virtually all of the inland of Australia is leased to just 4,700 families. That's not many people running an area two-thirds the size of the United States. Indeed, the various state governments as landlords are responsible for 70% of Australia. Already, the amount of our inland that's damaged beyond repair is more than six times the size of Tasmania. Yeah, yep, you know, they, they say it's a salt bush, but it really also is a, a protein bush too. Ian MacDonald has a real concern for the future of his land. Yes, well, there's no doubt. He knows that if current public concern for wilderness areas should ever swing to this arid wilderness, then pressure could mount on governments to remove him, his sheep, and those like him, in order to allow the land to recover. The landlord might evict the tenants to get the house in order. And showing just the, just the value of... Uh... But it's already too late. Our options have contracted. Removing the sheep now won't necessarily prevent any further destruction of the arid zone. Our man-made watering points have upset the balance. In droughts, the kangaroos will now stay by the water rather than follow the season. The rabbits, goats, wild horses and pigs we've introduced 
we'll all stay to carry on the destructive work we've started. A change in attitude is required if this land is to be saved. It's not an easy thing to achieve, as it requires a whole new approach to the way we treat the land. Ultimately, that system must take note of the natural forces we already know, the need for flexibility and the use of fire. The actual condition of the land should be our first consideration. It should come before anything else. This is the difficulty because the land is the last consideration at present and the results are plain to see. It's not as simple as just spending the money or forcing the people here to be more caring. It's a new way of thinking about our land that will result in an entirely new system. A system uniquely ours specific for Australian conditions. We must change, or else we will have a wasteland.